we'll let our panel introduce themselves. We lined up a great panel for today. So let's meet him and, and get right into the conversation. Uh, so let's start with, um, with Hans, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Hans Skandel. I'm an extension agronomist uh, at NDSU, and I've been working uh, with cover crops for, uh, you know, maybe since uh, 92. Awesome. Thank you, Hans. And now we'll go to John Birch, who is our farmer from Hillsborough. Hi, yeah, I'm John Birch from Hillsborough, North Dakota, uh, third generation family farm here. And so, and I've been doing cover crops since, oh, since my first CTC with Abby. And that's a while ago now. I don't even want to date myself, but I think uh, four or five years ago. Yes, that was about four or five years ago. So you're dating both of us. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, now we'll go to Carrie and Nicole, who are from Holly, Minnesota. All right, um, I'm Carrie Olson. This is my sister, Nicole, and we farm in Holly with our dad. Um, he started the no-till process about 20 years ago. Uh, we've been fully no-till since seven years ago and started cover crops about six years ago. Awesome, well, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Let's use this opportunity to walk through using cover crops in different parts of rotation. Um, and I think maybe, because each of you are growing different crops, but maybe we'll focus on uh, some of the more common crops of small grain, corn and soybean, um, and what do you do for cover crops within those rotations um, of cash crops? So, so maybe Kyle, if you want to kick off with the first question. Yeah, um, the first question is for you, Hans. Um, why is using a cover crop after a small grain such a, such a good fit, and what do you recommend for timing or different species that work well? Yeah, those are critical questions, of course, when we think about cover crops, we want to have production. And so if you think about sunlight, uh, once we harvest a crop, like say end of uh, July, beginning of August, we have still uh, quite a few uh, months available for sunlight and good growing conditions to, uh, cr to grow a cover crop. In other places within the rotation, there is always a, you know, kind of a conflict with the growing crop. So there is a less time on the, on the clock to grow the cover crops. So from a, a kind of a timing aspect, uh, the best would be if you can harvest your uh, small grains. But when we talk about small grains in my mind, I'm also thinking about canola or flax that can be harvested early. But this early uh, harvest, let's say uh, beginning of August, uh, then if we can plant uh, a cover crop uh, soon after that, that gives us the maximum time till, till we freeze uh, up in the fall. So when we think about species, uh, of course, uh, we need to think about what our objectives are, uh, but um, I've uh, experimented with field peas, there's a good uh, crop that fixes nitrogen. But if you think about uh, establishing a cover crop that also goes into the next season, maybe you should include uh, something like winter rye. But uh, some that are also quite good to include are the, the brassica species like uh, the, the, the turnips or you can have uh, any radishes. So basically, uh, you know, it, it depends on your uh, main goal. Uh, one thing that I would say we should avoid is uh, trying to grow warm season uh, crops uh, into August because those will not do well once the temperatures get cool, but many of the cool season crops will grow all the way till, till freeze up. We have maybe a light frost in uh, the third week of September, but that doesn't mean that the plants can not grow more uh, into October. So the timing, uh, the amount of time we have uh, is really great to have that one in a, in a small grain uh, situation. And I remember looking at some of your plots this year, Hans, you had, you had messed around with, I suppose you had some soybean that you seeded out there after small grain harvest, and then you had some cowpea, and, and those really got nailed by the frost this year. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I know that that is a risk, but I just wanted to see what would happen. And this year was a prime example of how it didn't work because I planted them in August and it grew three weeks. And then in the first week of September, we had a frost. So it completely killed those warm season crops. So um, that is the disadvantage of a small, a small uh, uh, warm season crop. What I forgot to, to mention is that uh, what I also did in this case is I let the volunteer small grain be part of the cover crop system. And that really helped because uh, although my uh, soybeans and my cowpeas died, still I had something growing there and that was the volunteer spring wheat. Has anyone tried growing a cover crop with a small grain to gain more growing time? Like so growing them, I'm guessing the, this question if I'm, if I'm phrasing this correctly is that you grow a cover crop with your small grain cash crop to see how that might extra add some growing time. 
Yeah, so that one is a good question. And it has been done in the past, actually. We used uh, small green crops as a, as a nurse crop, we called it, for uh, establishing alfalfa. So you grew, uh, like say, an alfalfa under a small grain. And then once you harvest it, the alfalfa started to grow and you establish it. So uh, also with some of the clovers, it has been done. We have to realize that there is very limited light available uh, during uh, the heading period of the small grain, then about 90% of the light is utilized by the grain. So there is very limited amount that comes uh, to the bottom of uh, the canopy. Uh, so uh, we need to have a species that is tolerant to, uh, to some of the, uh, the shaded conditions. But it, it could be done, um, but you have to have also a cover crop that stays somewhat low because if we have an aggressive uh, cover crop, it will uh, outcompete with uh, the small grain. Maybe let's go to what's being done on farm uh, with cover crops. And, and I'll ask Carrie and Nicole, it's good that you're in the same screen so you can pick and choose which question each of you wanna answer. Um, but maybe I'll start with asking this one to Nicole and, and you've been using cover crops after weed on your sandier soils. And what's your management goal? And then, and then what do you use and how has it worked uh, in the time that you guys have been trying it? So um, when my dad first wanted to experiment with putting cover crops on a small grain, we have wheat and then we follow with corn. So he was doing strip till for a couple of years and that worked but um, wanted to get to the point where he didn't have to use it because with labor and with cost, it just, it was always hard finding time to get it done. So he had heard of the idea of a bio strip um, by Joe Brecker out in North Dakota and thought, well, maybe I could try that. Let's see if we can use the plants, which is the same thing as the iron. Um, and also on top of that too, we put, we inject hog manure in one of our fields every year. So we also wanted something that could soak up those nutrients and hold on to it. So he started kind of looking at different options. We really, what we found that we like here is um, we have radishes and flax in the bio strip. And then um, on the sides or in between, we kind of mix it up depending on what the soil test says or what the field needs. Um, but anywhere between, you know, volunteer wheat or another mix, whether it be oats and radishes. Um, sometimes we'll do peas too, if we get in really early. But what we've noticed for our success is we have to have that drill following the combine. The sooner we can get in, the better. And then also rain. I mean, that's kind of been a big thing too, if we can get a lot of growth. Um, but the biggest thing we're always looking for is we want to make sure we're help, helping infiltration, um, a biomass for that erosion. We've noticed around our fields here, especially with some big winds that we had in December, that there's hilltops and other places that are um, losing their soil already or whatever, and there's not as much um, snow there. But in some of our fields, especially that have this cover crop, we've been able to keep the snow there and hopefully that moisture will stay there with us. Yeah, I imagine the moisture is a pretty big deal on some sandier soils to, to keep that there, not used too much, but, but keep the residue there high enough that it's going to conserve some of that moisture. Um, Carrie, is there anything you want to follow up with equipment wise on that that you've been doing or um, how you're getting that bio strip down? We use our John Deere 1895 no-till drill. Um, my dad had it actually before he started the bio strip, but uh, it just coincidentally our mid-banders that we put fertilizer on in the spring line up with our corn rows. So that's where we do our radish and flax in the bio strip. And then we um, use the 10 inch um, seed openers for the oats, the lentils, the field peas, whatever else. Um, we also had a, on our tractor, we had a pro tracker hitch as well as we used GPS on the tractor and on the implement um, to help with side hills and make sure that we're staying on that row. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things we wanna try moving forward is maybe some fava beans. Um, I've seen on Twitter, some of Joe's pictures and just, I think we got the breaking up of the row down, but we want that black soil to warm up our soils and dry it out faster. John, uh, the next question is for you. You also have small grains in rotation. Uh, what was your primary goal in using cover, cover crops in this part of the rotation? Uh, what cover crops have you used or tried and how has it worked in high clay soils? We've mainly used, so, you know, after, after wheat, I kind of probably get the neighbor's head spinning just a little bit because uh, we will probably, we'll go out there and we'll actually put cereal rye out. Um, and I, what we've done is we've taken a Diggleman Pro-Till um, and equip that with a interseeder, um, not an interseeder, but a cover crop box on there um, that we're putting down a cover crop after we've harvested that wheat. And then we put um, 
uh, radishes on the headlands just to um, work with the compaction and everything like that. But what I'm trying to do is that we, we do fertilizer and then we also do that cover crop um, right after we get done with a wheat harvest is is my goal um, that I'm doing. Uh, a lot of people, you know, and I know we'll probably talk about it a little bit uh, later on here too, but uh, people always wonder in our high, our robbing moisture from your cash crop. Um, in our high clay soils, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried whatsoever about ever robbing moisture. Uh, some of our best years are, you know, drought years. Uh, I mean, is there, is there a potential for some issues with drought? Yeah, but uh, kind of nine times out of 10, I, I'm more worried about getting the moisture out. So that that's my worry, you know, just as uh, Carrie Nicole were saying is kind of that black dirt and getting things warmed up. I'm more worried about that and controlling that moisture. So um, we kind of try to use, have green out there growing all the time, uh, basically like after wheat. I haven't done anything yet in um, soybeans uh, yet. Uh, that was my goal in 2019, um, uh, but that kind of got away from me there. Uh, 2019's fall and everything like that. So my goal is here in 2021 um, that we do uh, do some work with cover crops and soybeans, either flying on or else um, uh, interceding there as well to broadcasting it on with fertilizer spreader. So I would imagine that rye is a pretty big deal for you, John, where having it in those high clay soils to manage moisture both in the fall, but then probably also in the spring. And do you worry about termination timing on it or how much moisture it is using or biomass? I learned the hard way termination uh, this year, uh, 20 or last year, 2020, um, is yeah, just getting it terminated in time. You don't, you, you really want to watch that window if you can go out there. So I plant green. So I go in with a no-till drill in springtime. Um, but I want, I want it green because, yeah, I want it sucking up that moisture because of the high clays and everything. But then uh, termination is key. So as soon as you see that window, um, you really got to be on top of that to get out there and get that taken care of. Because all of a sudden, a couple of rains and that that rye is still living, you know, longer than I would ever want. And I, I had that happen this year. Um, and I quite certain, I mean, the, the beans still did great, but I, I'm quite certain that we had a ding on yield um, just with, you know, how how late that that rye was still going. And then are you worried, John, at all about like seeding time for rye or you just go out there whenever you can get it in the ground and, and get it seeded? I'm not too worried because of the interseeding that we're doing. So we're interseeding um, when we're side dressing corn um, the previous year. So uh, I'm not too worried there. We've had, I've really liked uh, interseeding um, and getting that system down uh, just because I've seen a lot of good establishment, good growth uh, right, right out of the chute there. Once you get to fall time, you know, I, again, this last year, I wanted to do a little bit uh, of it with our pro till after we had sunflowers off, I wanted to go and put a cover crop out there, but it was, it was just too late uh, in the season. So my goal going into 2021 here too, is to see if I can intercede uh, some cover crops into sunflowers as well too, uh, with the side dress unit that we have. Carrie, we have a question in the chat for you. Do you have difficulty staying on the biostrip rows when planting in the spring? I wouldn't say we've seen a lot of issues, um, especially with that pro tracker hitch from strip till. I mean, that was the goal of it was to keep it straight on. Um, I don't think it's going to be perfect, but uh, it's good enough. And the any plants that were in there are like the radishes are pre, are gone at that point. You can see the little holes. Um, they decompose, and same with any of the other plants that are in that in that strip too. That's why we're very careful of what we do put in that bio. Let's go back to Hans now and see, um, we'll continue through our rotation. We've talked about wheat and cover crops after wheat and let's go into, into corn. Um, and what successes and failures, Hans, have you seen with cover crops and corn? And are there any tips that you have uh, from the research to, to make this a success? Yeah, so when we talk about corn, uh, we talk about a tall plant. So um, at, uh, when it is very tall, it, it really utilizes a lot of the sunlight. So uh, John was already talking about interseeding. So you could say, well, let's go in to the plant when it is still young and you can still get into it with a planter, uh, put the seed in. At that time, uh, the young plants will have enough light to start establishing. But as the corn plant starts to grow, 
all of a sudden you will see that the light that actually uh, goes down into the canopy is greatly reduced. So we have limited light available during a period. So it is hard for the cover crop to kind of get through that uh, low light uh, period. So as the season progresses to the, towards the end, the leaf starts to yellow and a little bit more sunlight is coming in. But the plant is still standing straight. So uh, compared to uh, an open canopy where all the light comes through, there is still a limited amount of light that comes into the canopy till you actually kind of knock down those stalks in the, in the corn. So uh, typically we see a lot less biomass produced uh, in a, a corn situation than after wheat, what we talked about earlier. However, we can establish like say a winter uh, rye. And then once we have it established after harvest and there's still some light there, it will really establish and then it goes through the winter and you have the benefits in the spring that you have a cover and which can also suck up some moisture at that time. Uh, so there are some growers that uh, think about, uh, you know, putting the cover crop into the, um, the corn at the end of the season by plane, just uh, broadcasting it over the, the top. Then we have to realize that, of course, seed only will germinate if there is enough moisture. So this is sometimes tricky to get that right amount of moisture for the germination. So there are some challenges. So uh, when you make a plan to do cover crops, you always need to pay attention to the, the forecast so that you have conditions that uh, the crop actually can germinate. John, another question for you. Um, you might have briefly touched on this, but what have you tried with interseeding corn as far as flying it on, interseeding equipment, and how has this worked on high clay soils for you? Yeah, so I first started, um, you know, I kind of, and Abby's always alluded to it as well, too, is like, you kind of want to take some baby steps going into uh, cover crops, you know, and just don't go all in. And so my first round of it, just to kind of get started with cover crops, was flying it on. So we flew it on into corn, um, you know, as around that August time frame, um, just so I could see, okay, what kind of establishment are we getting? You know, what does it look like? Um, and I'm, am I really bought into the system? And that's kind of how I've looked at it too, is that it's, it's more and more as I'm doing this cover crops, you really have to look the look at this as a large system actually. Uh, so we, we did the flying on, I was like, okay, everything's, you know, working, it's doing uh, the way that I wanted to. So then um, the next time that I was at uh, the CDC conference, I had talked to some people about updating our side dresser so that we could intercede it. Um, and I kind of saw some uh, different equipment that I was able to do that. So we equipped that next year. And then we kind of started, you know, doing more and more interceding, basically more and more acres um, getting across, uh, uh, doing it with the corn there. So um, like Han said, it, it is definitely a timing thing. You you really want to watch your weather, um, you know, and that that's kind of twofold when I'm putting down nitrogen, you know, I, I want a little bit of rain, but then also I want some moisture uh, to germinate that cover crop as well too. The uh, the only problem what was that that was two years ago and you kind of learn learn things as you go but uh, four inches of rain at one time uh, you know that's no fun because I can definitely see how fast my seed is moving through the rows at that point in time but you yeah you kind of learn that or learn and go there so um but then I think the last part of the system for me that I'm figuring out too is drain tile drain tile is a uh, a big part of maintaining that moisture um, and then going into uh, springtime and making sure that we're not very saturated in those soils um, with the cover that we're having out there now as well too. Let me just follow up with a question on that is, you know, did your seed, the cover crops that you were seeding, did that change from when you're flying it on versus when you were interseeding it with your equipment? The biggest thing that's going to change, of course, is uh, your seeding rate. So as able, you know, you're able to lessen your seeding rate because um, it's better seed to soil contact. Uh, I didn't really change. I haven't changed really much my species that I'm using. I'm really a lot cereal rye and a lot of radish are, are my two that I'm using until I get more over into the soybeans and try to interseed there. So I haven't changed uh, my my species that I'm putting down, but my uh, my rate definitely got lighter, um, which is nice because it almost it 
it lines up a little bit with actually my refill times as well um, for the nitrogen too. Let's go to, to Carrie and Nicole and ask you guys some questions about your interceding work on your farm. I know you've built an interceder and you've um, been maybe gone from that same progression of flying it on to now interceding it. Uh, do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? So we began experimenting with um, cereal rye and a couple, we've done uh, radishes. We've tried some clovers this year. We've done rapeseed in the past. A lot similar to John, where we had we wanted to do it in the same way that we were already like before adding another pass. So we were already side dressing. That's the perfect time to broadcast um, the cereal rice. So that we started that and we mounted mounted a gandy box on there. Um, and so the gandy blows the seed in front of the coulters, and then the coulters kind of cover it up a little bit. Um, but I don't think I mean it's working all right, but it's not where we want to be. Uh, we are on 20 inch rows and I think the shading has been huge. Um, I mean, it's great because it, when dad switched to 20 inch, it was, you know, to um, suppress weeds and, you know, get that canopy closure. But now that we're trying to get cover crops out there, uh, it's not ideal. So yeah, um, we've, at this point we can't change our planter, so there's nothing we can do there. Um, but we've been you know, trying different chemicals, seeing if the residual effects anything. Um, we did buy a stripper header, so we're hoping maybe, you know, not so much trash on the ground, more seed to soil contact. Um, but so far, I don't think we've been really worried about moisture, but that's because we've had pretty wet springs. Um, but we just know in the back of our mind that we need to, you know, watch that moisture level and then be ready to terminate it whenever needed. Have you seen different cover crops that do better than others, or have you experimented around with some of those different species? We love the cereal rye and radish. Um, that's always kind of worked. Rapeseed did work pretty well too, but we just kind of thought we'll stick with one brassica. Um, we're interested to see what the clovers um, do. I kind of was out there scouting a little bit and you could see them, um, but I'm interested to see what it's going to look like here in the spring because we should have hopefully some growth in the spring with it. So something newer we're trying. We're not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet. But. Awesome. Well, John, I've seen some clovers on your farm that you've interceded. And, and do you have some thoughts on that that you can give Carrie and, and Nicole? Can you repeat that question? I was answering one of the questions in the chat right oh. now. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I that promise you, I was, yeah, I was not ignoring by any means. So uh, what was the question again? Or what was oh, it? They, they talked about they're trying some clovers this year and, and uh, curious to see how it looks next spring. And I know you had some clovers on one of your fields that I that I looked at one time. And, and what was your experience with clovers and how'd that work? Um, yeah, we had, I guess I wasn't, I didn't look at them particularly um, because I mean, they, they had good growth and everything like that. So when you came out, um, I'm trying to think, yeah, that was when I had interceded it, I believe. So, and I'm trying to remember the rate as well too, that had winter kill, of course, and everything. Um, but it was, I thought it, I mean, it established very well, um, you know, into the fall and everything like that. It did what I thought needed to be done. And then coming into springtime, it was very easy to manage. So I, um, I would think, what, did you guys, I'm trying to think, did you guys say that you are interceding that then with the Gandhi box? Correct. Okay. And you're just not getting good establishment? Yeah, I think our shading is just a big issue for us. I mean, it's there, it's just not the growth that we would want, I guess. And you said 20 inch rows and then um, when kind of about what stage-ish are you guys, you know, when do you guys try to go and do uh, your side dressing? About V4 to V6 stage. Okay. okay. Earlier yeah. better. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's that, you know, and I think we've always talked about it, uh, um, Abby, an extension of, you know, we, we try to solve one thing and then we create another problem, basically. So it, it is that shading and Hans alluded to it as well, too, is, you know, yeah, how do we kind of fight that canopy? Um, you know, we we want that canopy, we wanted it for weeds and now we don't want it for cover crops. So um, yeah, that's, and I don't know if you want, you really don't want to go earlier at all. So I'd probably just maybe take a look at rates and see if you're able to maybe bump up the rate just a little bit possibly um, and just experiment on that on a small, small acreage, I guess. Hans, do you have any perspective from a research uh, point of view on um, clovers or anything like that? Clovers are typically a crop that uh, takes a long time to establish. 
So it is not very aggressive. So whenever I've worked with it, when we you know introduce some shading, it uh, is not producing a whole lot of biomass. So sometimes we think about clovers uh, and other legumes as um, you know th those are the ones that give us nitrogen. But there is a direct relationship between the amount of nitrogen that is fixed and the amount of biomass produced. So if you are in including those legumes like the clovers into uh, the cover crops and you have very low uh, um, biomass, then the nitrogen that you fix is very limited. So uh, it, it depends again on what your aims are, uh, but I, I have not had too much success with uh, the clovers. And does competition from inner seeded cover crop uh, affect corn yields? Is that something people need to be concerned about? There has been a lot of talk uh, about, you know, any cover crop, uh, how much uh, yield uh, reduction might you get? So typically, if you uh, give the main crop the head start, so you plant corn and then, as John was describing, you come into it uh, when the crop is already growing, uh, typically, we don't see a lot of uh, yield reduction. It, it can occasionally happen, but uh, really, we don't see that. But, but if you start to think about, okay, we widen, for instance, the rows of corn in order to get more light for the cover crops, yes, you will get more cover crops, but we tend to have lower yields. But if you are growing corn in the, the normal uh, row spacing population, and you do not put the cover crop at the same time as seeding, uh, the yield reductions are limited. Right, that makes sense. Give the other crop a head start before you come in with the interseeded crop. Uh, and we have another question here on winter triticale performing similarly to rye, and if it would work on saline ground. Um, let's see, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. John, do you want to take a stab at this one if you've tried anything with winter triticale or, or had any experience there? And if you haven't, that's okay too. Yeah, I haven't had any experience uh, with winter trinochelia at all on saline ground. And I'm, uh, Abby, when you talk about saline ground, I guess, uh, knock on wood here, that uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have too much experience with saline ground, luckily, kind of with our soils. So just heavy clay, heavy, heavy clay. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. I'm glad you don't have salinity issues. I could take a stab at this one. Um, you know, I think of winter triticalia as more of like a grazing or forage type cover crop if you're going to use it uh, or go to the expense of that seed. Um, so typically, you know, winter rye, cereal rye, that would be, that would probably be preferable as far as cost and then also performance. Um, you know, on saline ground, I think that barley and oats are still kind of the, the kings of, of what works on the saline ground. Um, you could try rye in there if you needed something to overwinter and go into the spring. So so hopefully that helps. And I, Hans, you may have some experience with this too on some plots or something, but I don't know if it's similar to what I've experienced or, or not. I have not uh, worked with uh, Treaty Kaley, but the question that you bring up about seed cost, of course, is important. Uh, you know, Treaty Kaley is a cross between rye and wheat, so it probably kind of responds the same, but rye is much more winter hardy than anything we, we have. And then uh, also, if you think about seed cost, there are some hybrids. Uh, rye for, uh, varieties out there, but uh, those are very pricey. So, uh, you know, you have to consider within uh, the whole cover crop uh, discussion also the seed cost. So I think rye, uh, winter rye is still a good option. Moving on to soybean, this is for you, Hans. Um, if you've interseeded rye into corn, you're setting yourself up to plant soybean into living rye in the spring. What are the benefits of this practice? And what do we need to watch out for? Um, is there opportunity to get a cover crop after the soybean or into the soybean? If you're thinking about, uh, you know, growing a soybean into a standing crop, then one of the things that comes to mind is uh, the benefit if you have uh, ground that typically is uh, prone to IDC, um, maybe we get less IDC when we plant green. And the reason is, that one, the cover crop is taking up some moisture and moisture is one of the factors involved in the expression of IDC. And the second factor is that uh, the cover crop also takes up some uh, uh, of the nitrates and that is also a factor in IDC. So uh, based on some research that has been done in the past where we plant soybeans and let's like, say oats together, we see less IDC. So when we have a green cover, we typically might get uh, lower IDC expression. So the, the challenge, of course, is how much moisture uh, is the rye taking versus the anticipation of the season. So I've seen it happen that sometimes when you let the rye go 
a little bit too long before you terminate that the, the, the soybean is set back because there is not enough moisture. So that one would be of concern, but if you have plenty moisture in the spring, it will be a benefit to the soybean. Speaking of moisture, Carrie and Nicole, I bet you guys have to watch that rye pretty closely on sandier soils. And, and what do you guys do to, to make sure that that cover crop does the best possible job for you? We use our no-till drill to plant soybeans. So we really haven't had much issues with planting um, into our soils. We actually, I actually really like it. Whenever I look back, I feel like it's almost splitting butter where sometimes I feel like the drill can bounce around a little bit, but when I'm planting green, it feels like it just, it's so smooth. Um, but we have to make sure we really watch our rye. We haven't had issues with moisture yet, but we don't get a ton more snow or whatever the spring looks like. We really have to watch because they can dry up really quickly. So we're always making sure we can um, check that. And we usually, we usually kill our rye after we seed, but if we have to go out there sooner, we will. Nice. And John, you said you can never have too little moisture in your system. So what are you doing when you manage your rye in a high clay soil? For me, it'd be the opposite, like I uh, had explained before, is that I just don't want to get it so that it's growing ridiculously tall, basically. So I'm never worried about it robbing moisture. We, you know, going into this spring, um, you know, it will be the same as Nicole and Carrie as well, too, where we'll look at the snowpack, you know, just to make sure that we're kind of cognizant on that as well, too, because um, we don't want to be, you know, you know, bone dry in that first two inches of uh, the soil and everything like that. But, uh, you know, typically on average, uh, it's just getting out there in a good timing to terminate it after we've planted the soybean, no-tilled the soybeans into that cereal rye. I'd like to loop back to, we talked about planting green, but I'd like to loop back to the idea of a cover crop in soybean. And I know Hans, you've done a little bit of work with this on broadcasting a cover crop into a standing soybean crop. And and then I think each of you have, have started playing with that on your farms. And Hans, what, what have you learned from that, uh, that practice? Yeah, as we talked about uh, flying on, for instance, uh, rye into corn, which is quite popular in Southern states. It is also done to uh, put uh, rye into uh, soybeans. So uh, based on some of the things that we have done, if you plant a cover crop too early, uh, there is not enough light uh, for uh, the crop to grow. So when you kind of plant it, uh, early season vegetatively with uh, the soybeans being vegetatively at that point. So typically what we have done is looking at the soybean plants, once they start to kind of shut down, start to senesce the yellow, uh, yellowing of the leaves, that will be a good time because that is when it's opening up the canopy. So we have had reasonable good success to establish rye in, into soybeans at the end of the season. So I've tried uh, different things, row spacing. I've tried different uh, maturity, so an early maturing variety, uh, you know, starts to senesce early, so you have more, uh, more season left. Well, but the take home message is that, you know, you want to have the maximum yield of your soybean. And therefore, the best is to go with the normal uh, uh, maturity group that you have, because you give up too much yield otherwise. So uh, playing with the maturity is not a good idea. Roll spacing, again, you can go white roll spacing and you have more light, but we also see that the increase in biomass produced is not paying for the reduction in yield that you get when you open up the canopy by wider row spacing. So uh, my experience is that you can establish uh, rye pretty well in, uh, into soybeans. Uh, if you again pay attention to, uh, to rainfall occurring when just around the time you uh, are planting, uh, otherwise, if it is dry uh, seeded, it may just lay on the ground, but it is a good option. Okay, we got a uh, question from the chat. I think we'll ask Carrie and Nicole if they have experience in this, but uh, how do you manage allelopathy, say in like the rye or when mixing plants together? Is it an issue they have to worry about? We haven't really had too many issues with anything. Um, there was one year we tried corn after rye. We just had a couple of strips and we just decided to try. And I did notice um, some yellowing. I don't know if it was nitrogen de deficient or that um, what what there is, but I don't I don't haven't seen any. Have you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's why we're hesitant to try corn and rye is for that reason. We do know that corn and rye, and I think Hans could talk about this too a little bit. That 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 is a pretty challenging situation. So Hans, I don't know if you want to follow up on anything with the allelopathic effect or or anything that where you have concerns with there. Theory is that uh, the rye will have an, an, a, a kind of suppression effect on the germinating seed, or especially we think about weeds. So that's why one of the reasons why rye is always uh, 
utilize and the smaller seeds are more affected than not so if you think about you have a right cro uh, cover and you would put a small seeded crop in you might get some negative uh, effect in suppression but most of the crops that we plant we plant in rows and we plant them uh, precisely and we plant them probably under that uh, that uh, layer that is affected so uh, for most of the crops that we are really talking about soybeans uh, there is no issue with uh, any suppression of the of the, the rye. Let's just go around and if there's anything we've forgotten to ask you, um, we want to give you an opportunity to, to mention those things now. So let's start with John. I guess my kind of just take home for the group and everything like that, kind of like I'd said before, is just uh, really think about, you know, as you are approaching cover crops and everything like that, you know, a systems approach and how are you and it's kind of like we've already talked about in this conversation is that, you know, be prepared to, you know, solve a problem, but then um, you're also going to create a problem at the same time, too. So kind of be prepared for that and, you know, and kind of think through, you know, if you can think of the different problems, kind of think through, you know, possibly how you're going to tackle those. Because um, now is a good time. Now is a good time to be thinking about those during the winter time um, instead of kind of the heat of the battle. Um, and of course, you're not going to, you know, think of everything, uh, but, you know, just kind of coming up with a system of how you want to, how you want to tackle it and going into this year and then multiple years after that. Awesome. Thank you. Should we go to the same question to Carrie and Nicole? Is there anything we haven't asked you that you guys wanted to talk about? My piece of advice would be just to give it time. Um, I think patience is key in this game. Uh, I mean, we're like, we're six years into it and, you know, we're constantly changing things and new ideas and trying to make it better. Um, so I don't know, but that's what makes this thing fun. You know, it's just constant experiment. And for us, like we always need to remember to stay positive and stay curious because when we're exp experimenting, we fail all the time. That's kind of the norm or whatever. So you just have to be okay with it. And then also just learn from it. Cause I feel like that's when you learn the most is when you do fail. Same to Hans for your final kind of thoughts or, or ideas of things maybe we didn't ask you about. Yeah, we talked about uh, cover crops after small grains, uh, but uh, you know, we have also a lot of pea acres. And actually, if you think about pea, uh, and we usually get maybe half a bushel, a bushel of uh, seed that drops at harvest time, you can also use the pea, uh, you know, volunteers as a part of the cover crop. Uh, so there's another aspect. So we think about systems, where can you incorporate cover crops in, in the farming? So after uh, early season crops, ideal. And then we talked a bit about planting them in some of the major crops like the corn and the soybeans. Uh, John was mentioning briefly sunflower. Well, actually the sunflower plant is quite different in the way it, uh, it kind of dries up in the end of the season. So uh, the leaves, uh, once the head is uh, fully uh, uh, developed and it has bloomed, the lowest leaf already start to senesce, dry off. So actually you get a more light penetration in sunflower. So not a crop that uh, you can probably interseed into very successfully. Uh, I've done it many times. And when you plant the, uh, the cover crop later than the V4 growth stage of sunflower, you do not get any yield reduction, but there is more light in sunflower than we see, for instance, in corn. Has anyone tried frost seeding rye after corn to plant uh, soys into? I haven't yet. I've seen people, so social media, I've seen on Facebook and Twitter further south that they have uh, tried that. So Southern Minnesota, Northern Iowa. Um, and I've seen, and I think they were just doing that last year is when I saw it. So it would have been, uh, it will, would have been fall of 2019. Um, and then they posted the results in spring of 2020 um, and saw good things. I think I would say that one, probably more than anything you there's got to be a lot of luck that's got to be a little bit on your side if further north here I would say um, that it'd have to be uh, luck would have to be on your side a little bit but I think again there you go you know go try you know 40 80 acres something like that and see see what happens you know and then you learn yeah that's great advice keeping it small and reducing the risk of trying it on a few acres is a is a good idea and uh, we have a question about um, anyone considering integrating livestock into their operation and Carrie and Nicole I know you guys play with us a little bit this year. I saw some pictures of cows. Uh, we had a neighbor that had some cows and we decided just on a small scale to try it out. I think there was like 26 cows out there was all. Um, so the paddocks were pretty big and like we moved them once a week. But 
I don't think there was enough out there to really see a difference. I guess we'll see this spring. Um, but that's something I'm looking into doing is probably at this point partnering with somebody. Um, we're in, I mean, it's not that I'm not interested in it, but at this point we're in a transition in the farm. And so um, I'll just let my dad finish out his career and then I can see where I can take the farm in the future. Yeah, and then um, are there any new cover crops or varieties in development? I, this would go to you, Hans. Well, we have been working uh, for a number of years now with uh, winter camelina, which is a brassica, and that survives uh, really nicely during the winter. But the amount of biomass it produces in the fall, like when you intercede it in corn or in uh, soybean, is limited. I grew it this year after uh, the wheat and then you get enough light to get a good establishment. It will survive the winter. It is uh, as winter hardy as, uh, as rye. Uh, so that is a broadleaf crop. So we're still doing some research on that particular crop. Can you establish cover crops in oats after herbicide application? And this is well out of what I know. Um, Carrie and Nicole, do you guys have experience with some of the Herbicide applications are, um, oh, what do they call it, Kyle? The residual, <laughs> that's the term I'm looking for. I know my dad has had to change his chemical plan since getting into this. There is some herbicides that he can't use. I know like Halix is one of them. Uh, and I, I mean, we think maybe in our inner seating there might be some issues with residual, but we haven't found answers to it yet. I want to thank everybody on the panel for your time and for sharing your, your experience and knowledge about, about cover crops and your systems. Uh, so thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. But we're not done yet. We've got our Tech Talk segment. And today we're talking with Ward Laboratories, who is sponsoring this Tech Talk segment. And we have Alexis Hobbs, who is our soil health coordinator. So hey, Alexis, if you could give us a little background on you and what your favorite soil health tests are. My role is the soil health coordinator at Ward Labs. So I oversee the soil health department um, and review all the data. So any soil health tests that you send to us come through me. Um, and then from there, they get sent out to you. And if you have any questions, I'm the one that you need to reach out to. Um, my background is actually in microbiology. So my favorite test that we run is called the PLFA test or the phospholipid fatty acid analysis, um, which breaks down your total living biomass in your soil into bacteria and fungi and um, different categories in those. So that's actually my favorite test. What are some of the management decisions that can be made based on, some, on that soil health test? Or, or how do you use that test to, to manage your farm? Yeah, so we get this question a lot. Um, we actually give a general cover crop recommendation with the Haney test. So you guys are probably pretty familiar with the Haney test, I'm guessing. Um, NRCS is promoting them and everything like that. Um, so we get quite a few that we run. And we actually give a general cover crop recommendation. So we give um, percentages of grasses and legumes. And you can um, obviously choose the best species for your farm, um, but we do give you percentages on how to implement on your farm. What other tests do you offer that, that might, uh, might help farmers manage their system a little bit differently? We have um, been offering the water holding capacity test. Oh goodness, as long as I've been there, but it's a fairly new test still. Um, and that actually will give you um, essentially infiltration rates and how much your soil is holding water. Um, so that is actually kind of an up and coming test. I think a lot of farmers are getting into that um, because we're talking a lot about infiltration and decreasing runoff and everything like that. Um, and so if you can run that test, it's a great test to run. I will put a little um, kind of side note in, it is a 10 day test. So our normal turnaround is two days. Um, with that test, it's closer to 14 just because it's such a long test. Okay, so we're still gonna recommend that they get their basic fertility test, right? We need to know what kind of fertilizer application rates are, are required for a field. Um, how do they pair those traditional tests with something like a biological test or a soil health test? How can they use those two in, in conjunction? We get a lot of farmers that run um, just a traditional test. Um, so that would be our routine test. And then we get a lot of farmers that pair that with a Haney test. Now, those are very similar tests. They tell you very similar things. Um, but as far as like fertilizer recommendations, the Haney test is going to give you lower fertilizer recommendations, especially for N because we test the total um, kind of pie chart of um, nitrogen. 
So a traditional test is going to test inorganic nitrogen, so nitrate and ammonia. Um, what the Haney test does is it actually tests um, nitrate ammonia and then it tests organic nitrogen as well. And so you get a better picture of what's going on in your soil by using the Haney test. Um, so we can give you kind of better fertilizer recommendations um, based on that test. As, as a farmer might be trying out some different fertilizer application rates based on the Haney test, do you kind of recommend that they leave some check strips for the, the traditional test so that they know uh, what they're familiar with and then leave some of those other spaces where they could side dress later, say that that organic end doesn't turn over to, to be released? Exactly. We always recommend check strips. Um, we can't stress that enough. Those are so important when you're running a new test or you're trying out a different fertilizer or something like that. Those are always super important. Can you explain the Haney test? I guess I've, I've heard about it, but I would love to hear more about what all is involved in that Haney test and what it means. Oh, goodness. So the Haney test is so encompassing. So you're going to get all of your macros, your NPK, um, your calcium, your magnesium, and all of your micros as well. Um, those are all going to be analyzed using what we call H3A. It's an extract that um, contains three organic acids that are used to um, look more like a plant exudate would. And so what, um, what microbes are used to seeing in the soil as opposed to like a malic three that's just nothing compared to what's in the soil. So those are, um, that's the extract that we use. And so what we are analyzing is actually all plant available. Um, so that is something to take note of as well. Um, along with all of your nutrients, you're gonna get a um, soil respiration score. And that's gonna be equivalent to looking at how much um, microbes are in your soil. So microbes breathe like we do. And so we can actually catch that CO2 in a jar. And then we um, analyze it using um, a machine that we have in the lab. And that will give us a CO2C score in um, parts per million. And so obviously the higher the score, the better. Um, but we can see scores up to 500 um, in no-till cover crop system. So that's pretty good. Um, the next thing that you're gonna see is you're gonna see a soil health score. Now that takes into account your organic carbon, organic nitrogen, your C to N ratio, and then your soil um, respiration score. Um, so those four components go into that soil health score. And again, the higher the number, the better. We like to see that above seven. Um, anything higher than that is considered good. Now I've seen um, a 50 before in a no-till livestock integration, cover crops, all of that good stuff. Um, I've seen a 50 before. So obviously the higher the number, the better. Um, when you start um, with a no-till system, we see about an eight. Um, when you start implementing cover crops, we see about a 12. Um, so you do, you can see that um, progression in score with implementing um, those soil health um, principles. Okay, so that soil health score is not something that you're going to go to your neighbor's house and sit down with their score and your score and compare. You're going to just look at that over the course of time in your own system as to how that score may change for a particular field or something like that, right? Exactly, yeah. You're not going to go and you're not going to sit down with your neighbor and say, oh, my score is better than yours. Well, their soil type may be different <laughs> or their management style may be different. Um, so it's not... It's not to be like, oh, I'm better than you. It's kind of a relative score. So as you see those changes or you adopt a new practice in the field, then maybe you start looking at some of these uh, different tests to help you maybe make sense of what's happening. So, so if you see, like you're saying, more CO2, I mean, I breathe heavier if I'm, if I'm exercising, which means I may be more productive or I'm cycling more things in my body, just like a soil would maybe breathe a little heavier and release a little more CO2, the more active it is. So, um, so yeah, those tests can be helpful with the with the water holding capacity test. I'm kind of curious about that as to as to how that's done in the lab or what um, what that means translating from field into or, or the lab result into the field, maybe. Yeah. So um, like I said, this is a new up and coming test that we're getting more and more samples um, requested. Um, what we do is we actually have two pressure plates. Um, they look kind of like pots um, that are under pressure. And one is for field capacity and one is for wilting point. Um, and um, if you're familiar with um, available water holding capacity, those will be um, terms that you're familiar with. 
Um, and so basically what we do is we um, put the soil into little rings and we wet it and then we put it under pressure. Um, we do 0.1 bar and then 15 bar. Um, and those, um, those, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Those simulate, sorry, um, those simulate field capacity and um, wilting point. And so from there we um, get it wet, we get all the water out um, to see how much is still being held within the soil itself. And so then we dry it and then we weigh it. And then from there, we can tell how much your um, soil is actually holding water. Thank you very much, Alexis, for that information on soil testing and, and soil health tests in particular. I think, um, I think it can be really important to understand those soil test results so that they're used in the right way, um, in a way that's gonna help you as, as opposed to maybe hurt you on some of these things if you're backing up on fertilizer and, and just making sure that you got it right and you understand the information. So uh, thank you very much, Alexis, and, and thank you to all our panel members. Thank you.